It's Origins 12, Creation and the Gospel. This is the uh, Sabbath School lesson for the first quarter of 2013. Again, we're doing it uh, one week ahead. The principal contributor was uh, James Gibson, who was the director of the Geoscience Research Institute. And um, the editor of the lessons is Clifford Goldstein. And there are a number of other people who've uh, contributed. And um, We've already been through 11 lessons. The last one was uh, Sabbath, a gift from Eden. That was actually done two weeks ago with our break for Andy McIntosh. It was a delightful person to meet in person as well. Um, this week we're going to be doing creation in the gospel, and the next week will be creation and again. Talking about the relationship between creation and the second coming. Our memory text is one that whenever I hear it, I hear Handel's uh, Messiah playing in the background. Uh, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall be made alive. That's, of course, the King James Version. Um, so in Christ all will be made alive. In the biblical account, Adam and Eve were created in God's image without any moral defect. But they did have free will, a prerequisite for them to be able to love. When Adam and Eve rebelled against God, they fell under Satan's power. See Hebrews 2.14, it basically says that. An act that brought the whole world under the enemy's power as well. And Jesus, though, came to destroy the works of the devil, which is what John 1.3.8 says, and to free us from his power. He did this by dying in our place and offering us life. On the cross, Jesus became sin for us, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, and experienced the separation from his Father that sin causes. By his death, Jesus restored the relationship between God and humanity that had been broken by the sin of Adam and Eve. All these points are logically linked to the creation story. Creation comes into the picture again as the power of the Creator God is exercised to create a new heart in his children. 2 Corinthians 5.17, which if you don't remember, therefore if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Renewing the image of God within us and restoring our relationship with him. It takes the person who created us to recreate us. Grace in the Garden is the title of the first lesson, uh, the, the first uh, Sunday's lesson. As we all know so well, the first humans, perfect beings created in the image of God, fell into sin which brought death. They had been warned and they understood what they had been told. Eve even repeated to the serpent what God had said, yet they sinned anyway. At times we, like Eve, are led into sin by deceit, while at other times, like Adam, we sin intentionally. Either way, we are sinners, guilty of transgressing God's law. Read Genesis 3, 9 through 15, and what was God's response to the sin of Adam and Eve? And uh, the uh, passage says that God was walking in the garden and didn't find Adam and said, where are you? Although he knew where he was. And he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to me be with me. She gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord uh, God said to the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said to the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go. Presumably, the serpent before this did not go in its belly. And dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now there's more that's said, but it is interesting how the response went. God held a trial, an investigative judgment even, 
The purpose of the trial was not so God could know, learn the facts, he already knew them. The purpose was instead to give the couple an opportunity to accept responsibility for their actions, the first step towards repentance and restoration. God asked them what had happened and they confessed, although reluctantly. Though they were guilty and though their sin brought immediate consequences, the first gospel promise was given to them in Eden before they had any of the curses visited upon them. Read Genesis 3.21, what further act of grace was revealed, and the text is, unto Adam also and his wife, they, did the Lord make coats of skins and clothed them. Of course, poor animals that gave up their, their coats of skins. Died because of it. And uh, the comment uh, is made, death came in, in a most unexpected way. Instead of the immediate death of Adam and Eve, one or more animals died. Imagine Adam's feelings as the animals died, perhaps in his place as a sacrifice. It was the first time that Adam had seen death, and it must have brought him enormous mental pain. Then the animal was skinned, and a tunic was fashioned from the skin. The skin was placed over Adam's body to cover his nakedness. Every time he looked at it or felt it, he was surely reminded of what he had done and what he had lost. More important, it was a reminder of God's grace. Question? Yes. This matter of nakedness leaves me wondering. Is there something wrong with nakedness? They, we're told that there was a... Uh, covering of life. It says, and Adam and his wife were naked and were not ashamed. So, I suppose that a covering of light might have made some difference, but I think also that there's something about when you're fresh from the hand of God, it isn't, you know, you don't have any secrets to hide, it isn't embarrassing. Um, there are lots of people who try physical cures for spiritual illness. Um, people with OCD, for example, will wash their hands many, many times. People who have had, if I can put it that way, people who have had, um, well, let's say sexual encounters with somebody that turns out to be um, not what they expected and a, a really bad person will oftentimes take showers afterwards, take three or four showers afterwards, trying to feel clean again. Uh, one can argue that it's irrational, and I suppose on one level it is, uh, but I think you'd have to say it's natural. It's the way we feel. It doesn't, it doesn't take anybody to train you to feel like, I just feel dirty. Mm -hmm. I, I've run into that phenomenon a number of times of people who've uh, uh, discovered that the, that the guy that they were with was actually, let's say, uh, bisexual. <coughs> And it's the natural thing to take a shower to try physically to get rid of something that you're not going to get rid of physically. Certainly not in that way. Yes, Ariel. Uh, just just to to add to the picture and uh, uh, a different view in a way. Uh, you know, when Moses was up with God in the Mount Sinai, he came down. He was covered with light. Uh, and I wonder if 
maybe there's a, that's an analogy or at least a parallel of Adam and Eve having been with God and they, uh, they were covered with light. I just, just want to throw that in as an alternative. Um, or both of them may be partly true. I think the thing that we haven't really talked about yet is, is the vulnerability uh, of being naked. I mean, anybody who would go out on the street and walk around naked would feel very, very vulnerable. And I think that when there is no sin, uh, that would not be a problem. But uh, when there is sin, it becomes a problem. In our neighborhood, uh, up in Ritchie Canyon, we have a nudist camp. Um, unfortunately, it's been there for many decades, and the valley used to be somewhat proud of it. But the members are all elderly, and they all look like truck drivers, that is, um, um, abdominous cats. Um, it's not a pretty sight, I'll just tell you frankly. Uh, and, and I used to preach uh, that if we in church would take all our clothes off and be naked, that would be the best thing ever for health reform because we would be <laughs> truly seen as we are today uh, pretty much uh, not attractive. Attractiveness ends preteen anymore. No, I, I think you're, you're partly right. And uh, uh, clothes are because we are afraid of what we will think or we're afraid of what somebody else will think. And that doesn't mean that they're going to be done away with anytime soon. I, I think that that will have to wait until a, a world where well, we can trust everybody else. So in heaven, our clothes will be made of cotton, not skins. Uh, interesting observation. The, uh, the lesson goes on to say, no doubt we should all be very appreciative, to say the least, of God's grace to us. What better way to reveal that appreciation than to show grace to others? And then it asked, to whom could you show some grace right now, however undeserving he or she might be? And it's a thought-provoking question. Sin and death. In Genesis 3.19, Adam was told that at death he was returned to the dust from which he was made. The same thing happens to us. Notice, we do not return to being apes because we were not made from apes. We were made of dust, and it's to dust, to death, that we return. Read Genesis 2, 7, Psalms 104, 29, and 30, John 1, 4, Acts 17, 24, and 25. What is the ultimate significance of these texts for us, and how should this truth influence the way in which we live? Genesis 2, 7. Of course, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Psalm 104, Thou hidest thy faith, they are, tr they are troubled. Thou takest away their breath, they die, and return to their dust. So they, everything returns to dust. Thou sendest forth thy spirit, they are created. Thou renewest the face of the earth. And then John 1, 4, In him was life, and life was the light of men. I'm not sure why that particular one was thrown in. It, it is true that um, that in, in Jesus was life, um, but what that has to do with dust, unless you put it with the other ones, which are the, the real point, I think. And then uh, Acts 17, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven, dwelleth not in temples made uh, with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing that he giveth life to all life and breath and all things. And uh, that perhaps makes more sense with this, that uh, God is the source of all life. And the breath that, uh, that made Adam a living being. 
Life is a marvelous phenomenon. We are all familiar with life, but there is still something mysterious about it. We can take apart a living organism, but in the end we find nothing there except various kinds of atoms and molecules. We can collect the molecules in a container and heat it or pass an electric spark through it or try any number of other experiments, but we do not get life again. There is no entity called life that exists within a living body or a living cell. Life is a property of the entire living system, not an entity that can be separated from the cells. And uh, we can now substitute DNA into a, an organism and have it uh, continue to live. But it's interesting that we can't build the whole organism from scratch. All we can do is substitute one set of DNA for another. On the other hand, we know much about how to produce death. We have devised many ways of killing living things. Some of these methods reveal in astonishing detail the violence and cruelty of our sinful hearts. Death we can produce, but the creation of life is beyond our grasp. God alone has the ability to create living organisms. Scientists have tried to create life, thinking that if they could do so, they would have an excuse for why they do not believe in God. So far, all such efforts have failed. Read Isaiah 59.2, How Does Sin Affect Our Relationship to the Life Giver? And the text reads, But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. If life only comes from God, then separation from God cuts us off from the source of life. The inevitable result of separation from God is death. Even if one lives 969 years, as did in Methuselah, the story still ends with, and he died. Sin by its very nature causes separation from life and the result is death. And so far with rare exceptions that's true even for those who've given their life to God. While we are yet sinners, all throughout the Bible we find that God's response to human sinfulness is redemptive in nature and motivated by genuine and selfish love. He would have been fully justified in giving Adam and Eve up to Satan's destructive power. After all, they would made their choice. But God knew that Adam and Eve did not understand the full meaning of what they had done, and he determined to give them an opportunity to become better informed and to be able to choose again. And uh, I think we all expect to see Adam and Eve in the earth made new. Read Romans 5, 6 through 11. How do these verses help us to understand what God's grace is all about? And these are familiar verses to most of us for when we were yet without strength in due time Christ died for, for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet for adventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if while we are enemies, we are reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. When we are wronged, we like to have an apology before we accept the offender back into a good relationship with us and sometimes not even then. Of course, an apology is appropriate in such circumstances. Complete healing of a damaged relationship includes an expression of sorrow and acceptance of responsibility for the misdeed. But God did not wait for us to ask for forgiveness. He took the initiative. While we were yet sinners, he gave himself to die on our behalf. This is a wonderful demonstration of divine love. How does our behavior compare with God's behavior? How often are we offended and angry and seek revenge rather than restoration? We should be eternally thankful that God does not treat us in that way. God's treatment of sinners shows the true meaning of love. It is not a mere feeling, but a principled behavior in which every effort is made to reconcile the offender to the offended and restore the relationship. God's treatment of Adam and Eve is an illustration of how he relates to our sin. The scenes, upon, uh, the scenes of Calvary call for the deepest emotion. Upon this subject, it will be excusable if you manifest enthusiasm that Christ, so excellent, so innocent, should suffer such a painful death, bearing the weight of the sins of the world, our thoughts and imaginations can never fully comprehend. 
the length, the breadth, the height, the depth of such amazing love we cannot fathom. And that's, of course, Ellen White, Testimonies, Volume 2. Um, the comment is made below that, that maybe we can't fathom this love, but why is it so important that we try? And I suspect because if we tr don't try, we'll have no clue. The sin-bearing substitute, Christ is a redeemer from the curse of the law, having been a, become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And that's Galatians 3.13, which um, we'll see in another slide. Uh, dwell on the amazing implications of this text, keeping in mind the deity of Christ as you do. What does this tell us about what God was willing to do in order to save us? More so, what does this tell about how tragic it is for anyone not to accept the provision that Christ has made in our behalf? Keeping Galatians 3.13, which we just read, in mind, Read Matthew 27, 46, and what did Jesus' words reveal about what he went through on the cross? And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? On the cross, Christ accepted the curse of sin in our behalf. This was a change in his standing with the Father. The sacrificial lamb, when brought to the offer, uh, altar, became a substitute for the death of the sinner. Likewise, when Christ went to the cross, his status before the Father changed. Shut out from the Father's presence, he felt the curse that our sin had caused. In other words, Jesus, who had been one with the Father from eternity, experienced a separation from the Father in what Ellen White called the sundering of divine powers. However hard it is to fully comprehend exactly what was happening, we can know enough to realize that an amazing price was paid in order to redeem us. And then a new creation. The great news of the gospel centers around the death of Jesus as our substitute. He took our sins upon himself, bearing in himself the penalty that would otherwise justly be ours. As we have seen, Two, the whole idea of Christ as our substitute dying for the sins of the world is inextricably linked to the creation story. Death is an alien intruder in God's creation, and Christ came to destroy it. If evolutionary theory were the chosen way that God used to create humans, it would mean then that death, far from being an aberration and an enemy, would instead be part of God's original plan for humanity. Indeed, death would play an important role in the way in which God created us. It's no wonder then the Christians must reject theistic evolution as a viable way of understanding the creation story. The Genesis account, however, cru crucial in helping us to understand Christ's death on our behalf, also helps us to understand another aspect of the plan of salvation, that of God's work of creation in us as we partake in, of his holiness now. Read Psalm 51.10, Ezekiel 36.10, 26 and 27, Colossians 3.10, and 2 Corinthians 5.17. What promises are given to us here that were linked with the concept of God as the creator as revealed in Genesis 1 and 2? And uh, Psalm 51.10, most of you probably know by heart, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Uh, Ezekiel 36 a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments, and do them. And I think there's an important clue there. When God puts his spirit in it, he takes responsibility for making sure that we walk in his statutes. And uh, Colossians 3, and have put on the new man, which is review, renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. And of course, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, uh, as one we've read before, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. A new heart is a creation that only God can make. We cannot make it ourselves, but must depend on the same creator who formed the world and created our first parents. David recognized his need and asked God to solve the problem. 
by an act of creation. Indeed, the person who is in Christ is a new creation. The old way of thinking must be taken away and replaced with a newly created mind. Our new mind is created for good works in accordance with God's will. This kind of creation is a supernatural process accomplished through the power of the Holy Spirit. The original creation gives us confidence that God's creative power is able to change our lives and to bring us back into relationship with him. And then the quarterly asks, have, have, how have you experienced what it means to be a new creation in Christ? What does this mean in a daily practical sense? What is it that changes in the life of someone who's had this experience? And now for Friday's lesson, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever. Deuteronomy 29, 29. Just how God accomplished the work of creation is never revealed to men. Human science cannot search out the secrets of the Most High. His creative power is as incomprehensible as his existence. That's from Patriarchs and Prophets by Ellen White. And then, in that thick darkness, God's presence was hidden. He makes darkness his pavilion and conceals his glory from human eyes. God and his holy angels were beside the cross. The Father was with his Son, yet his presence was not revealed. Had his glory flashed forth from the crowd, from the cloud, every human beholder would have been destroyed. And in that dreadful hour, Christ was not to be comforted with the Father's presence. He trod the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with him. That's from The Desire of Ages, Ellen White. Now, I'm going to switch over to the book that's the companion book, and I, I'm just going to hit a few themes that uh, are not treated uh, significantly in the uh, quarterly itself. Um, he points out that the good news was given to Adam and Eve before the bad, that first of all, Eve would have enmity with the serpent. She wasn't going to be left uh, constantly attracted to the serpent. Secondly, that she would have children, um, which meant that she wasn't going to die that day. And finally, that one of her descendants would, at some cost to himself, destroy the serpent. Um, the sacrificial system was partly understood, probably not completely. Um, uh, his comment is that resurrection is recreation, that it's, uh, that it's accomplished by somebody who can create in the first place, a theme that I think we'll be dealing with more uh, uh, next week. And then he discusses the everlasting gospel, which uh, I'm just going to take the text and put it in parallel to in the way that, that uh, he, he notices, Fear God and give him glory, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and the fountains of water. So you have parallel, fear God and worship him. This is actually a, a good Hebrew poem, except of course it's written in Greek. Uh, but then we have a lot of those. The Psalms are translated into Greek and then into Latin and then into English and and because of the the way Hebrew poetry works uh, the translation still can catch most of what the point was and um, but the, the the interesting thing is that there's a parallel between fear God and worship him and then there's another parallel to judgment and creation and in, in the fall, there is the judgment of the serpent who was punished himself and others were released from his control. And then there's a number of things that, um, that the book lists that the, only the creator could do. Uh, and I won't go through the whole list, but if you're interested, it is in the book. 
And then he says, without creation and the creator, there can be no gospel. There's no good news unless it's the person who made the original owner's manual that's running the show. We have fallen from our, uh, our original state, not risen from the beasts. Otherwise, why would we need to be saved? And from what? Now, my own personal take on this, I think the connection between the gospel and creation seems fairly obvious. Uh, now, I'm not saying that you can't possibly look at it in any other way. Although I would say it, it looks that way. But I do think that if there is anybody that wants us to uh, take theistic evolution as a s serious offer, I think it's incumbent on them to offer a theologically defensible explanation for the death of Jesus. And I think furthermore that there needs to be an explanation as to why the great controversy scenario is still valid. Um, in spite of the fact that we're jettisoning uh, the first 11 chapters of the Bible. Or, alternatively, how the great controversy scenario can be abandoned without destroying Christianity in the process. And I don't really see either one of those being done. And until somebody addresses those, I see it as pointless to try to argue for theistic evolution. If you want to argue for atheistic evolution, you can do that. But theistic evolution says that in spite of evolution, there is still a God, and that that God has to uh, uh, has to be compatible with Christianity. At least the theistic evolution that's usually presented claims to be Christian. Then you've got to figure out how you're going to either incorporate the great controversy or else how you're going to do without it. Now the discussion questions at the end of the quarterly, I'll just throw them out and then uh, we'll open the floor for dis uh, formal discussion. How is the gospel related to the story of creation? What specific aspects of Genesis 1 to 3 are foundational to the gospel? How is the story of Jesus based on the historical veracity of Genesis? And how would one tell the story of Jesus if there were no Adam and Eve? Which is basically a variation of the question I threw out. Second, the Bible maintains that creation was accomplished by supernatural processes that are not accessible to science, but that can be learned only by special revelation. The tension between the Bible and science is therefore not a surprise, depending on how you define science. Why is it a mistake then to expect science to be able to explain all of God's creative works? Well, if you define science as methodological naturalism, then if Jesus really did do all the creating by means that are not known by modern science, then trying to fit them into modern science is a fool's errand. As indicated in Revelation 14, 6, and 7, what links exist between the gospel, creation, and judgment? And then the final question is, critics of Christianity will often argue that Jesus knew beforehand that though he would die, he would be resurrected to life. Um, and Jesus does give some uh, indication of that when he says that the Son of Man will die and will ra be raised in three days. Thus, they ask, what was the big deal about his death when he knew it would be only temporary? How does Matthew 24, it's 27, 4, that's my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, uh, supplemented by the Desire of Ages statement in Friday's further study, help to answer that objection? And with those questions, I will invite uh, further comments. I am further comments, I guess. Granted, the focus of the lesson was the gospel, and grace was certainly presented. But then it got into some language toward the end there about Jesus being in us, and one thing and another, and, 
uh, you begin to wonder just how this works. Scripture says that there is none righteous, no, not one. All our righteousness is as filthy rags. We look around at mankind and we do not see predominant examples of successful Christians. It's been a marvelous week of watching the Catholic Church and finding out that 50% of all priests are homosexuals and a great many of them are pedophiles and, and uh, all the dirt that comes out makes you, makes you wonder even about the holy men, if they are holy or not. But one thing that is not addressed in this was the subject of justification. How one makes the transition from, from overwhelming grace, good in itself, to the commandment keeper, the obedient one, the, the, the lovely Christian, the person who, who is an example of, of the good that God wishes for us. I think it's Second Peter that says we must become partakers of the divine nature. And we have yet to explore exactly what that means. But God has made provision for us to become partakers of the divine nature, even the steps that we should take. And of course, Ellen White comes along with a hammer and says, life is a, a struggle, a daily, every day, a battle and a march to overcome. She, she dwells a great deal on that. So it isn't just grace magnificent as grace is, there's something that must transpire within us, something that happens within us that would change us into somebody you wouldn't mind living next to in heaven, someone you could trust all the time, someone who would always be loving and gracious. We have stopped short of that dimension. And I think we need to explore it more fully. I think God had higher intentions for us, <laughs> higher than the highest human thought can reach, is God's plan for his children. Godliness, godlikeness is the goal to be reached. We need to spend some time on that justification process. And then Christianity becomes exciting. Well, oh, uh, just following on that, along that line, I, um, there's this uh, cliche called cheap grace, which I think, uh, emphasize a little bit, just a uh, previous comment a little bit. It, it's, it's not just a matter of, okay, well, I, I've sinned and Christ died for my sins and I can keep on sinning uh, because he covers all my sins and he's covered all my past sins he'll cover all my future sins. Uh, I think that's uh, uh, a very... Uh, might say, uh, unreasonable approach to it. I, I'd like to uh, throw in a, just the term commitment here uh, as a, an addition to that that is necessary. It's not just accepting uh, uh, what you might call cheap grace. We have to have a, a commitment to God, to goodness, to uh, Christ, his sacrifice, and so on, as accept that as, as uh, uh, part of the equation. But uh, just one part of that equation, which you might call cheap grace, is not sufficient. You have to have commitment, you have to have a change of, of uh, priorities, and uh, so on, if uh, uh, you're going to be able to um, uh, at least be a uh, contributing uh, citizen to goodness uh, here and in the hereafter. Well, I'll uh, 
give a few thoughts on that. Uh, it seems to me that uh, grace comes in at least three flavors and maybe mixtures of them in some cases. Um, first, there's the grace that keeps us alive. And atheists get that grace. Uh, people who are angry at God get that grace. If uh, you want to go as low as modern society thinks, Hitler got that grace. Um, not completely, he died in the end and probably earlier than he would have normally. But we're all given a, a certain amount of uh, slack to work with. That's uh, Jesus' observation, which you know comes partly from the Old Testament as well. But uh, you know that that God uh, sends the sun to shine on the just and the unjust, and the uh, and the uh, and makes it rain on the on the uh, righteous and on sinners. Uh, so there's a certain amount of grace that's given to everybody, period. Mm -hmm. Those that accept it, I think, God gives the grace of forgiving sins. Even though some of them will struggle with those sins for the rest of their lives. And then finally, there's a very special kind of grace that comes sometimes. It doesn't happen to everybody, and it doesn't even happen to the same people all the time. But there are people, for example, who commit their lives to God, and suddenly they're not interested in alcohol, tobacco. They give up a relationship that is damaging. Uh, and it's done seemingly without effort. Now, if I knew what that was, and I was crass enough to can it, I could make myself a millionaire, I th I'm quite sure. Because there are a lot of people who would just love to have that kind of experience and would pay almost anything for it. Although, maybe I might observe that they'd pay anything except a, an actual full commitment in some cases. Um, St. Augustine pointed out that one of his prayers was, Lord, make me righteous, but not yet. And I'm afraid that there are a lot of us that, that fall into that category. But there are many people who agonize and struggle and struggle with sin and fall back numerous times. And there are others for whom it just is gone. Um, and there are people, myself included, where it's gone for a while and then it comes back. Um, and I don't know the answer to that question as to why some people struggle and other people just sort of, it disappears. If I knew for certain Well, the truth of the matter is if if Christianity in general, or Adventism in particular, knew for certain how that could happen. There are certain steps, if you do them, that it will happen. I think everybody would want what we have. Maybe not 
everybody because I think there are those who kind of enjoy um, the pleasures of sin for a season and are not about to give it up. But I would say that there's a huge number of people out there who would just love to be able to just give it up and let it go and be done with it from now and forever. And one of the uh, points that I will observe also is that some people have that experience with certain sins and not with other sins that they struggle with. But that particular sin just kind of disappeared for them. Yes. In Steps to Christ, Ellen White says everything depends upon the right action of the will. And we talk about willpower. And then she goes on to explain that we need to surrender that will to God, let him revitalize our will, our wish to do things. Once we have that will reestablished, then it needs to be exercised in order for a person to grow in grace. There are a lot of things that I gave up of a negative nature to become a Christian. Was that it? You know, 15 items and that stops, you know, I don't, uh, or should I be growing beyond that? Should I be tackling each and every sin that possesses me with a, with a, with a mind to getting rid of it? Just as I got rid of drinking and smoking and, and all those other things. I used to travel a lot and used a lot of gas, and every gas station had a candy machine in it. And I was away from home for meals. I needed nourishment. So I had a candy bar. Then one day it dawned on me what I was doing. It was stupid. And I determined never to do that again. Exercised a will. Now, whether it was my perverse human will or whether God was inspiring me through the spirit, I don't know. But candy machines are not a temptation to me anymore. And I think the experience of a Christian is to, is to look at life and face every one of these weaknesses. I'm not a Catholic. I do not go to confession and that takes care of it. I have to grapple with each weakness. And by the power of God, I have overcome 15 of them. There's still an undisclosed number. But, but, it, but that's, that's the, the excitement of Christianity. That's the building. That's the succeeding. And when that person gets rid of 15 or 25 or 30, then truly God begins to be visible in this person. Uh, that, that's the Christian witness. That's the lovely person that we can become. God had in mind not only a, the glory of heaven, he had in mind some glory here. And that's the third step, that glorification. Justification, sanctification, glorification. God has a beautiful plan, an exciting plan, but the church hasn't found it yet, but it's all there, so plain, so well, clear. Some of us are finding it in bits and pieces here and there. If it ever becomes a, uh, a general movement, I think the church will be unstoppable. The commentary this week is that the church, Catholic church, is dying and Europe and one priest said it's dead there <laughs> well Protestantism is dead in Europe too I saw many churches turned into garages and other things dead uh, 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 what is it the Laodicean message they have a, a name of life but they are dead the Adventist church is dead it has a name of life, but today it's running on a very cheap fuel, your 
cheap grace is what it's running on. But it doesn't have life. And I don't know when I don't know when the church is going to examine this, when they're going to wake up to it. Interestingly, um, the church outside of Europe and North America, actually Western Europe and North America, is very much alive. Um, we have turned into the toughest mission field in the world. Um, at least the second toughest. Maybe Islam is a little harder. Let me warn you, I was a missionary in South America. The union I was in led the world in baptisms. Come to find out from one of my close American friends who took a job ministerial director, when he reported the number of baptisms in that particular area, he was immediately called on the carpet by the union director. What's wrong with you? Your predecessor had much higher baptisms than you. So he called his predecessor and he said, oh, these Indians don't bother to report. So I just add 10% to last quarter's report and send that in. I was in a meeting of world leaders once and told that story and a man jumped to his feet, his face livid, and he said, young man, young man, just shaking his finger. He said, wherever you see these large numbers of baptisms anywhere in the world, that's a mistake. And he's right, it's not easy to be a Seventh-day Adventist. You give up your job, you give up so many things. We are obsessed with these huge numbers of baptisms. In Peru, we baptized people two or three times. If once was good, second or a third time was better. The people were primitive, they lacked understanding. I would ask them, ¿Dónde está la Virgen Mary? Where's the Virgin Mary? In el cielo, they would tell me, in heaven. They didn't have a clue about Adventist truth, but we baptized them in droves. Every church in America for, uh, that I know best, the real membership is probably in 50% of the membership on the books. The Loma Linda University Church has thousands of members. Wonder where they are on Sabbath. Yes, Ariel. I think this is a, a real concern. I think we are obsessed with numbers and we hear very little about quality. Quantity is the big mantra right now. Quality, uh, not so much. Uh, I, I think we would do well to uh, uh, try and uh, have some concerns. You know, we like to grow, get bigger. You know, our institutions get bigger, and oh my, that's success. Uh, college enrollments, that's the big thing, and so on. But what, what is the spiritual strength of those institutions? We don't ask that question as much as we should. Uh, keep in mind that uh, Christ did not encourage, especially that uh, we were going to have great numbers. You know, when when he said, uh, "Few are they that find the narrow gate," uh, and we shouldn't be so uh, encouraged by great numbers. Maybe. Maybe we're on the other side uh, when we see so much growth. Just an just interesting sideline here. Now, I, I don't know if I should say this or not, but a, a sermon I heard this morning talked about how it read some texts about how people will know us by our love for one another. And they has emphasized this love must be, you know, here we are... Uh, multicultural, multinational, you know, we must be that, that kind of diversity, multi-denominational, 
uh, just ill knows by our love. Um, and some, you know, other things were said. And I wonder, um, you know, are we really getting superficial, that superficial? Uh, a comment was somebody made about Loma Linda University that wonder what will happen when the sleeping giant wakes up. Uh, and that's could apply to our church as well, I guess. And I guess some things have to shake us up before we'll, we will wake up. That may be. Well, if nobody else has anything to say, I'll, I'll raise a question about uh, theistic evolution since that entered into the lesson. It did. Uh, if you're going to accept the idea that there is a God in the picture, it's a different discussion than in our usual uh, discussion of, well, it's uh, natural, naturalistic science, whatever you, if you want to call it, methodological science or atheism. Uh, effectively, these are all the same operation. God is out of the picture. Uh, but if you're going to change the, the picture to, hey, put God in the picture here, you need to uh, uh, have uh, at least uh, some answers and uh, questions were alluded to in this lesson about the problems of, of theistic evolution. And uh, I, I would say uh, among the among the leading ones are uh, the fossil record and what it shows. And these multiple extinctions, you know, six or seven uh, often listed in the fossil record, uh, these extinctions of our times uh, at various times through the fossil record. But those are the mass extinctions. That doesn't count all the individual extinctions that take place right. as well. Right, but, but, but these, are, these are mass extinctions and uh, more impressive. Uh, you have to, what kind of a intelligent God, if he's intelligent enough to, to create life, various types of life and so on, would create these things uh, only to see them go out and extinctions and then create another set uh, and so on only to see it go out and extinctions uh, what a, a wasteful uh, process that you have to explain for an intelligent god as you look at this uh, fossil record and then then that god uh, or gives you the Ten Commandments, and he says, hey, I did it all in six days. Uh, and he doesn't just give the Ten Commandments, he speaks them, and then he writes them once, and then he writes them again. Right. <laughs> uh, hardly anything more direct from God than those Ten Commandments, uh, and so on, so that... Uh, uh, while a lot of Adventists on the internet, I notice in, in the discussion, uh, blurbs and so on, uh, web pages and so on, they just seem to accept, uh, well, the, uh, evolution is a fact and so on, a long time is a fact and so on. Uh, I think you, you look a little deeper into that situation, you're, you're going to find uh, some very serious conflicts. I, I just cannot put a picture together there that uh, it's much easier to explain these fossil record in terms of the flood. I think, uh, in, uh, well, I don't have all those problems solved at all. Uh, then to uh, try and explain some, some of these other things of, you know, hundreds of thousands of species that God created that died out why create them if uh, you're going to have this uh, tremendous graveyard out there uh, that things is more easily explained in terms of the flood? Well, not only that, it puts it, God, it puts God as a very bumbling creator. You know, he tried a little of this and mm -hmm. he tried a little of that, and finally he figured out how to make different body plans so he could make stuff in the sea, and then uh, made better and better stuff as we get along. Um, 
and humans are just his latest creation. Um, uh, accepting God and long ages raises questions which I think we have not been raising uh, enough that, that uh, makes it not very tenable uh, in terms of uh, logic. You know, interestingly enough, I saw Kenneth Miller and Massim Massimo Piglucci or something like that debate uh, Bill Dembski and um, and Paul Nelson at an atheist conference once, about 2002. It was in Burbank, California. And uh, the first thing, the, the, um, Piglucci didn't do too well. I mean, he was, just, he was uh, didn't make a lot of sense, at least from my point of view. Uh, Kenneth Miller, though, did a just a beautiful job of, of taking down those two. It started out by asking Paul Nelson, well, are you, how old do you believe life is? And Paul Nelson, instead of just simply saying it, hemmed and hawed and worked around and finally Ken Miller got out of him that uh, that he believed that life was only, you know, less than 10,000 years old. And Ken Miller's comment was, see, that wasn't so hard to do. And then he just left Paul, uh, Paul Nelson alone. Uh, I, I think in that case, Paul Nelson would have been better off to, to come out right out, out front and say that. Uh, but the one that really got to, uh, was really impressive was, okay, and Bill Dembski, how, how old do you think stuff is? And he said, millions of years, I basically accepted the standard geologic time scale. Uh, and then he said, well, now, when did your God intervene? Was it at the Cambrian explosion? Was it at the origin of life? Did he do it three or four times? Did he use something to erase all the stuff he'd done? And just really ate him alive theologically. And that's the thing I think we have to realize is that theologically, you've got no defense if you go long age. Even for a bright person like uh, Bill Dembski. You really don't have much of a defense. <clears throat> and you might as well start out by being a creationist mm -hmm. and, and, and defend that right off the bat. Because then you can tell a coherent story. Otherwise, you don't really have any place to go. Go ahead. <coughs> we talk about our church being asleep. Really, it, it isn't asleep. It's going two, two ways. We're going two different ways. Uh, it just isn't real apparent right yet. Uh, we're dividing into two groups. Uh, and sooner or later that will become more evident. It already is if you look carefully, but um, the, the division is happening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I, it's about 11 or 10, 11.35. They haven't changed that clock yet. Um, and uh, this is probably as good a time as any to stop and give those of you who want to go someplace else a chance to do so and uh, we can continue the private discussions later. Remember next week will be creation again which will be talking about the resurrection and the second coming and then the week after that we're going to have some uh, an exciting story about uh, carbon-14 and dinosaur bones being presented at a conference and then the attempt to erase it afterwards. So, I just want to say that, that for April 27, uh, Advent Hope has, has agreed that we can meet with them for that. And so on April 27, we will plan not to be here. If you come here, you'll find signs on the door, I hope. 
uh, saying go down to Advent Hope, which is in the Damaso Amphitheater at the Centennial Complex. Mm -hmm.